everybody, welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name is Hutch. And my name is James. People's poll, James. Let's get straight into it. What were the topics? Were the topics? Harry Kane, Premier League legend, or does he need a trophy to confirm as such? Answer in one word, Suj. No, I'm not going to answer it. Why not? Because you said we were going to talk about it on the Patreon Tottenham tomorrow. So oh, why right. would I, why would I make people get my opinion for free when we can charge them for it? <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, binned Premier League players was also an option. Uh, we've got people like uh, Eric Bailly, he's obviously heading out of Manchester United, Harry Winks at Tottenham. I was going to look at all these players who've kind of been binned. Chelsea have got a large number at the moment who haven't been squad numbers. And what could happen with these players? Yeah. Uh, got a lot of interest, but didn't win the vote. And I intentionally made sure that the vote finished before Monday night football started. The winner of the People's Poll vote was for us to do an extended podcast today. On the Monday night football between Manchester United and Liverpool, English football's biggest match. Often overhyped, doesn't often live up to expectations. I think it did last night. Well, people were quite surprised. The closer we got to the game, I predicted uh, Liverpool to win in our predictions on Friday. But in a group chat with some other mates, they were like, what do you think the predictions are going to be? I put 1-1 down. I just thought, you know what? You can't... Manchester United had to react. They had to react, otherwise um, they would they would have had pelters from the fans. And to be honest with you, for all that talk of a protest and what have you um, against the Glazers, they supported the team from minute one. Um, so fair play. But uh, yeah, it was it was a hell of a game, I guess. Like if you look at it from a stats point of view, um, because I only watched highlights, I didn't watch the whole game, mate. Um, Useless Nah Better things to do in my time I watched uh, something else We'll talk about that Maybe on Patreon as well um, You watched that Game of Thrones shit Is that what you watched? No 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 I haven't yet House of Thrones House of Thrones Dragon House of something Dragon. or other House, Yeah I haven't watched that yet But I want to um, You Liverpool Dominated the stats For Loads of stuff Hold on Jurgen Klopp thinks Liverpool should have won <laughs> <laughs> but United dominated the stats, perhaps, that matter um, or the stats that they might think are more important to them in terms of distance covered, tackles made, big chances that they had. It, it, it looked through the stats and even the highlights that I saw that it was a classic counter-attacking, a, a, a very well-planned, played-out counter-attacking performance but also a really good pressing performance because obviously they covered a shitload of miles let's start though at the beginning when you saw the teams you think Ten Hag's made some bold decisions in dropping Harry Maguire dropping Ronaldo and he's both put players Easy on to the, say afters, put players on the correct. on the pitch that he trusts although seeing McTominay and Eriksson as a two you think mm. but then you look at Liverpool's midfield and you're like oh, Harvey Elliott Jordan, uh, uh, Jordan Henderson and uh, Milner, wasn't it? It was a three. And Elliot. And you think they're a bit light. So that's not them at their strongest or, or at their best. And then you're thinking, all right, what's hap- going to happen in this midfield? Yeah. Um, when I saw the teams, it didn't cause alarm bells. Um, the team was not too unexpected to what I thought that Ten Hag would pick. I, I did a little piece for our advanced tier patrons yesterday in the run-up to the game, saying that if, if I'd have been Ten Hag, I'd have played 5-3-2 and really picked a flat five and made it really difficult for United. Um, in hindsight, the restrictions on that system would have been they couldn't have got in Liverpool's faces in, in the way that they did. That's why he's paid the money and, and I'm not. Um, it, it was interesting. I'd said on the pod last week that I felt if United lost to Liverpool and Southampton, they would sack him. And when I said that, I wasn't saying I would sack him. I was saying, I think United would sack him. But in within 15 minutes of the start of the game, I knew that even if United lost last night, all that talk was going to be off because of the way they'd set up and how they went for Liverpool off the ball. They were so aggressive. You mentioned tackles. It's the most tackles they've won in a football match since 2018. Yeah, it's five, four years. So, uh, ironically, it was a game against Liverpool. Now, you would you would kind of, in a way, you would expect that. The running stats... Are four Brent- years is four years. It's, it's a long time. time. The, the, the running stats against Brentford were 
well documented. I think the way that the, the game went in the sense that Liverpool did end up with 70% possession, you would expect United's running stats to be more than Liverpool's. You would expect a team that's going to have 30% of the ball is going to have to run more than the opposition. Mm. That's actually just common sense to me. But they 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 certainly put in the, the hard yards and they went for Liverpool almost in the same way that Fulham went for Liverpool in the first half in, in game week one. And condition-wise, it was more difficult for Fulham, it's worth saying, because the weather, the lunchtime kickoff. Um, the, I think the weather yesterday certainly helped a little bit as well. I'm not saying it would have impacted the result, but it apparently absolutely lashed down. You could tell that the pitch was soaking wet and they were watering it prior to the game as well. And I saw that pre-game and I thought, well, I don't know if you want to be having a quick pitch here against Liverpool, but it absolutely worked into... United's favour you think when you get home atmospheres where the crowd gets really up for it and stuff it's not on the dry bone pitch is it no nope. it's when people can go in and have people and I think the way games are being refereed at the moment leans into the whole aggressive nature of a te- teams need to come and be aggressive at the moment I think particularly teams playing at home in big games you're and I thought the refereeing performance last night was fine by the way there wasn't anything in the game that was worth questioning but definitely referees as a whole at the moment are letting a lot more go in terms of physicality of of challenges. Um, and I think that played into United got the crowd onside really quickly and had to. Right throughout the team, there were things that made the crowd happy. So if you want to start from the back in the first instance, David De Gea not playing short free kicks. so Or goal kicks, rather. So I was really surprised that they decided to move away from that. But what he'd obviously done cleverly, Ten Hag, has gone, OK, look, clearly from these first two games, that's how I want to play. I want to play through teams and out from the back. Liverpool are a pressing monster, aren't they? Mm-hmm. With the likes of Salah and Diaz. Their timing, the way they structure to go and pressure the receiver rather than the actual passer. They're the best in the business when they get it right. But he couldn't last night. David De Gea made three passes inside Manchester United's half Went long. The just whole, hoofed it. That's went, what, yeah. I wouldn't say hoof it. No, but went no. long the whole game. One of the tactical Hate structures. Hoof they, it. One of the tactical structures they actually had in the game was from direct balls quite often swapping Rashford and Sancho's positioning so they could play diagonals and have Rashford go and challenge for headers with Robertson rather than James taller. Sancho. Exactly a that. Bit taller. <laughs> so it was clearly designed strategy to go and bypass Liverpool's attack on the press and also bypass the midfield. Liverpool, how do they get exposed? It's the same problem all the time, isn't it? The channel between Trent and Gomez, or Is whoever's that? right-sided centre-back. Just pace generally, anyway. Mm. So, United utilised that. I think the one surprising name in the United lineup was Alanga. Mm-hmm. What I like about Alanga, though, is he's kind of he's not like your typical winger these days who wants to come off the flank and get involved inside. He wants to go and run at people, and he give Trent a real problem in the first half. Worth saying... In the second half, Anthony Marshall come on. It's best to have seen him look for forever. He was brilliant when he came on up front. Yep. And obviously Rashford moved into a wider area. And similarly, Rashford is the best he's played in absolute ages as well. He probably could have had a hat-trick last night, actually. Uh, the centre-backs were aggressive all through the game. So Martinez has been lauded a lot today. He and Varane were both fantastic. What they did well was they defended the box. But when the ball was there to be won, they went in, they were aggressive and they won it. Didn't let, allow Liverpool to come in and turn at them. If it was there to be won, they went and did it. These little things get the crowd up. Malassia playing left back. Really good. I thought that would be a big ask for him to play first game against Salah. Actually, although Salah obviously scored, you couldn't put blame on Malassia for the way that goal happened. Malassia played Salah really well. Dallo at right back was physical with Diaz. He did pretty well. I thought... I thought that was going to be a real problem in the game for Liverpool, uh, for United, was Diaz and Robertson on that side against Dallow. Didn't materialise. McTominay played fine. I think the reason he picked McTominay over Fred, Fred is at his best when actually, ironically, he can go and press. But would you put him in the team over Eriksson or Fernandes? No. And you need someone to go in there and be a little bit more diligent. And McTominay is better at that than Fred in terms of being more diligent positionally. Fred will lose his mind and go, I can win it, I can go. Someone in that midfield three had to sit a little bit deeper. And Christian Eriksen did a fine job as well. Bruno did business for the team last night. Often he goes into bat for himself, I've said, but he definitely did the business for the team last night. And the front three were, were a constant menace. 
in terms of their pace over the top Liverpool. They won the game through sheer will, will and desire. And I don't think I don't think Liverpool could believe. I think a real impact to the game, which I haven't heard mentioned yet, is I don't think Liverpool could get over the shock of United going direct. Which is United couldn't get over the shock that Brighton did that to them in game week one. United must have known that Brentford were going to do that to them in game yeah. week two. Obviously, that wasn't going to be an issue for United with Liverpool in game last night because of no Nunes. I wonder how different the game might have been if Liverpool had, had Nunes up front and him pulling onto Martinez. Because there are still games, as good as Martinez was last night, and he was really, really good, there are still certain teams who are going to cause problems for him. You could be almost certain now that when United go to Anfield, Nunes will play up front. And they will they will try and ping Van Dijk to Nunes and to Salah more often in the game. But they couldn't do it last night. And United were also massively helped by Roberto Firmino's performance, who I think unfortunately is regressing. He's been absolutely incredible for Liverpool, but was dropping so deep. And when he's done it at his best, what you have is obviously runners fill in the space. Salah does it, but didn't do it great last night. Diaz needs to work on it hard because although he's a super player and we love him, he's not going to get the output that Mane... Mane, Mane last night looked like a real miss for Liverpool, mm-hmm. looking at the game thinking, yeah. I bet they wish I mean, people there. said that after the Palace game that he was a miss as well, although Diaz did get the goal in that game. Well, but Diaz dragged Liverpool into getting something that, out of that game, yeah. in fairness. He was running around like a madman after, uh, obviously, the, in the second half there. But yeah, I mean... Credit to Manchester United. I think for our, all of us, we have to. We've we know now them. that there's a team in there yep. that can play a certain style. I think Ten Hag's kind of vindicated in the sense of if they listen to what I want them to do, we can get results. They've got some tough games coming up, um, but uh, the jury's out on Manchester United because one game isn't enough to say that they've turned the corner, but we know that the team is in there now. Um and we joked before the, uh, the the match yesterday that if they won, they'd go above Liverpool. They have gone above Liverpool in terms of points. And now we have to look at it. And I'm like, Liverpool only on two points. So cr- we give credit to Manchester United. Um, we wait and see now. Who have United got on the weekend? Leicester. Uh, Southampton. Southampton. It's going to be a different, difficult game. Which, uh, but they'll have to be on it because Southampton are high well, energy Southampton as well. are Jekyll and Hyde, aren't they? But in all honesty, in seriousness, if Southampton turn up and play with their aggressive nature that they can, they could still beat United this yeah, weekend. Yeah, a good game. But if United turn up to Southampton with the same mentality that they showed last night, they'll win. If they turn up to Leicester next Thursday with the same mentality that they showed last night, they'll win. Arsenal's afterwards is actually probably a more difficult game on in terms of paper at the moment. Because it's worth saying, as good as United were last night, there are clear fundamental problems in Liverpool that need to be addressed extremely quickly at the moment. So, Park United for the minute. Liverpool, it's difficult to pick out anyone who played well for them last night. Yeah. And I think they would probably all admit that themselves. Alisson in goal, fine. I mean, I think on the first goal he commits himself too much, but he's been great for them and he gets them out of trouble. He's kind of past the criticism. Trent at right back is a problem that's never going to go away. Um, I heard Jamie Carragher speaking on Hull about the back four after the game last night, saying about he doesn't feel comfortable about the fact that in every single game, someone appears to be able to get through one-on-one against Liverpool. But yet, he would go back, if you go and look at his comments in April, May, he would just sit there and go, well, that's how Liverpool play. Mm. So it's easy to throw the narrative when it's gone bad. This is what we know to expect from Liverpool. But individually, big problems last night. Trent on the first goal, like gives up on the return pass. Once Elanga gets to return, it's like his body stops, he freezes. Um, Van Dijk on that goal, what is he doing? Looks like It looks like someone's put him under arrest and handcuffed him behind his back. He has, and he's been the best centre-back in the league for the last four years or so, and he's obviously world-class. I think he has a psychological problem where he can't accept getting what I would call, and I think the kids would call, getting done. This has been stat, been rocking around for ages. Oh, people don't no take one on. Him. No one passes Virgil van Dijk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Maybe this is one reason why. He doesn't put himself in a, in a position to be passed. Mm. There is no logical way 
Do you think he loves himself a little bit? It's a brilliant goal from Sancho, by the way. He, you know, he he gives he gives Milner the the eyes, and he's gone. He sent Allison. He rolls Bang. in the corner. How Van Dyke can't come out to close that and not like understand the gravity of the issue in that moment that if you don't close the space, your man's got an open goal. Admittedly, Van Dyke maybe doesn't know that Allison's on his bum, but Van Dyke is standing plumb center in the goal. So if anything, he's arguably blocking. Allison's view, if Allison is still standing, he has to go and close the ball. Liverpool, I've spoken about this before, intentionally allow shots on goal. It's one of the reasons. But not from, it shouldn't from inside the, the box no. around the penalty spot. That's the, but the then, difference. But then go back to the Zaha goal at Anfield last week. Zaha gets sent away by Eze. Scores, a, scores an absolutely brilliant goal. I described it yesterday as an on finish. It was an absolutely brilliant goal. But Van Dijk gets across and allows the shot. Mm-hmm. It's almost like something in him isn't prepared to, at that last ditch moment, I've got to throw my body in the way of something in Will case a I grass get stain on his shorts. It, or no, I don't think it's even the case of that. I don't, in case he gets mugged off or something, it's strange. Okay, it's strange because as good as he is, it's not beyond criticism. And there's two two incidents in the last two games where I think you've got to do more there. Now the the Zaha one, you would still look at that and say Zaha ends up putting it in off the post. If it's half a foot inside, Allison still saves it. And that's part of Liverpool's idea, I think, is to trust the goalkeeper. If someone puts it top bin or puts it in off the, the foot of the post, fine, brilliant goal. But they don't want to allow things like deflected goals and things like that. Because that can obviously happen and wrong foot a goalkeeper. They'd rather trust the goalkeeper to make the save. But in that one last night, Van Dijk has to close the space. Yep. I can't I can't like give any defence for it. Joe Gomez was was absolutely disastrous as well. It, it, you could tell he was shot of confidence really early on. I mm-hmm. was impacting him. Basic passing, going out of play. Um, I wondered even if during the game, if Liverpool would consider putting Van Dijk to that side. Because I think it would massively help Trent as well if Van Dijk covered the space on that side. Yeah, He's so often that side, isn't it? Um, I don't think playing Joe Gomez over Nat Phillips was a mistake. It is worth saying, do you know when Gomez and Van Dijk last played together? You probably don't, Serge. A year. Last time they started a game of football together was when they lost 7-2 at Aston Villa. Wow. Yeah, ironically. But yeah, That's a long time. To be fair, in the season before that, they'd been uh, absolutely brilliant together. Obviously, that was Van Dijk got injured a couple of days later at Everton. The season before that, Gomez and Van Dijk had been absolutely fantastic together. Um, but he's he's well short of it at the moment. You're looking at him, Joe Gomez. I think if you play well, you can get back in the England squad and stuff. Not on that performance last no. night. Andy Robertson, I think it's a it's a concern that in two games running he's been taken off. If you remember going back into last season, he was taken off against Tottenham late in the game when they were losing. He was taken off against Palace for Shimikas. He was taken off when they were chasing the game last night. Um, and I don't know if he's struggling fitness wise a little bit. Seems strange. There's a whole mm. week between Palace and, and United. United and it's another five days before Bournemouth. And I don't think anywhere you're losing to United, you're not thinking about the Bournemouth game. Admittedly, the caveat to that is Liverpool obviously really short in terms of squad depth at the moment. And perhaps that's why that Shimikas is a body who uh, you could call a first team player now, if you will, and will bring fresh legs to the team. But taking Robertson off, Two games in a row is a little bit concerning, I think, as a FPL manager. Such is the same. Probably a little bit concerning. Maybe we'll come back to that. I don't own him. Do you not own Robertson? Oh, no, you've got Alisson, haven't you? Mm. I've got Robertson. But he's a concern, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, Alisson. <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, he's a concern because Liverpool allow up chances. We'll come back to that. Mm. The the midfield three were... Harvey Elliott did okay. I thought it was really good against Palace and he warranted playing again. Probably like you, when I saw the team... It was, in, in my mind, it's United are on such a downer here, it's not a problem. But yeah. looking at that midfield three, I'm thinking, I'll tell you what, if that was the midfield three for 38 games, they ain't winning fuck all. Yep. I, honestly, I don't get the whole non... I don't know if Fabinho was carrying an issue or... But not playing... He it. must be carrying an issue because that was the biggest omission that I thought, hang on, this is a bit bizarre. Maybe he was. Um, I didn't hear yeah. or read anything. Um, he obviously came on later in the game when they were chasing. Milner was Milner looked like um, 
a headless chicken. I can't put it any. I thought you were about to say like a thirty-eight year old man. <laughs> Is he thirty-eight? I don't know. Oh, he's, he's old enough. enough. Listen, he's been he's been, a, he's been an absolutely incredible player, but he he was bad last night. And Jordan Henderson wasn't at his best either, by no means. Um, I spoke obviously about the problem of Firmino dropping off earlier, which when it works really well for Liverpool, does work really well. For, six. Firmino's average touch position was deeper than James Milner last night. I mean, that's that's too deep, isn't it? Yeah. Considering that with Liverpool's three, we don't actually associate their midfield three as being... It's not like, say, with Fernandes, you would expect playing, and admittedly played more of a 10 last night, breaking into the box. You don't think of that at Liverpool's players. The only one that's ever really done that in Liverpool's midfield three has been uh, Genie van Aldem mm. when he's played, or very occasionally Naby Cato's also a miss. So suddenly you're looking at it and going, OK, yeah, they've got Thiago and Cato missing. But the problem is, Thiago and Cato will miss some games. Cato's never had a yeah. proper run of 15, yeah. 20 games since he joined the club. Thiago will get injuries. Mm. Clearly Fabinho will as well. Um, and then you start looking at it and going, well, yeah, that's light, isn't it? Obviously, Oxlade Chamberlain's, uh, and if they're all fit, we discussed this in pre-season. If they're all fit, we've potentially got seven. Uh, Curtis Jones isn't available as well. Yeah. They've actually got seven or eight players there. But I think once you start taking Fabinho and or and or Thiago out of there, it's not as strong as it no. should be. Agreed. And it's why I think they're not buying someone now because I think they think they're getting June Bellingham next summer, and rather than buying a stopgap, they want to wait for that next summer. I think that's the the decision the club are making. That's how it appears to me anyway. Mm-hmm. Difficult. Um, I'm going to be looking at getting rid of Alisson this week, I think, in FPL. I've got the double defence in Alisson and, and Trent. And I think I'm just going to be, I'm going to I'm going to get it done and, and move him on. You talked about them conceding shot. I should add, though, with the little asterisk, if I do it, I'm going to buy Salah and captain him as well because Bournemouth... Uh, the last team I would want to be right now is probably Bournemouth because Liverpool with two draws and a defeat in the first three have to f- get three points on Saturday. Uh, it's worth saying just on Bournemouth, despite the fact they've obviously played Arsenal and Manchester City, um, they're in the top half for expected goals conceded, even though they've conceded seven in the last two. Um, Liverpool are obviously one of the worst at the moment. So uh, just looking at expected goals mm. against on understat, uh, West Ham, Newcastle, Everton, Forest, Leicester, the only ones worse than Liverpool at the moment. Um, interestingly, on XG, Liverpool, despite only having two points from their opening three games, are only behind Manchester City and Arsenal. And it's worth saying, directly behind Liverpool, actually, is Crystal Palace and Fulham, who were Liverpool's first two opponents. But are they higher because they would, they played Liverpool in the first three? Or are they higher because these teams are actually better than we realise? It's three games worth of data, so it's, it's not a huge amount. Um, my problem with Liverpool right now, I said to Sujov Cameron before we started, I nearly wildcarded last night. I really, really thought about it. Not because I really want to chop up the team. More from, I just can fix the two or three little things and, and save slash add quite a bit of value in the squad. So, Ivan Perisic went up last night. And obviously, if, if I'm on wild card, I can put him in, take the value. And if I decide he looks like he's not going to play nearer the weekend, you could take him back out. The problem I have at the moment from an FPL perspective is I have Trent, I have Robertson, I have Luis Diaz. And I think that unless I'm getting Mo Salah into my squad, I mean, it's absolutely madness to remove any of them at home to the weakest team in the league. Liverpool haven't lost a home game in front of a crowd since Sam Allardyce was managing Crystal Palace. It's 2017. I uh, I agree with you. I just don't five, like being doubled up. Over Liverpool. five years have not lost a home game in front of a crowd Yeah, in the league. Yeah. Uh, I've got two thoughts in my mind. If I go from Alisson to a... 4.5, Sanchez would be my choice at the moment because they're all right up until game week eight and I can maybe wildcard around eight, nine. Um, then I can turn De Bruyne into Salah, which is literally a one-week move. Captain Mo Salah against Bournemouth because I think they're going to they're gonna have to come out and batter them. And I think Palace, we've established, are a tough game. And then the week after, I can go back to De Bruyne quite comfortably uh, or... If I want to keep Allison in, and I think they are going to keep a clean sheet against Bournemouth, then I can just downgrade Luis Diaz to, to Gundogan 
and then get Mo Salah. But that blocks me from going back to De Bruyne from Salah the week after. So I'd rather just downgrade my keeper to, to Sanchez, get Mo Salah and captain him and it's two free transfers. So I'm going to come off this double Liverpool defence now. So, I mean, look at it again on paper and I'm sure most people right now, you got to do it, James, you got to do it. So Robertson to Perisic and Hyun Ming Sun to Mo Salah. Salah. Um, minus four, get me, I think unquestionably, the best captain at the weekend, despite last night. Worth saying, he's, he's XG last night, 0.15. Um, he's not even Liverpool's highest for XG this season. That's still Darwin Nunes, with, despite only starting one of Liverpool's three games. But I think Salah at home to Bournemouth. There are alternatives this weekend. Haaland, De Bruyne, Jesus, even Kane and Son. There are definite alternatives. This was always a week going into it. You look at it and go, yeah, the four from the, the teams we really want most from FPL, because I think from Chelsea, it's only really kind of James Cucurella, maybe Mount. There's more interest in Tottenham at the moment than Chelsea. There's more interest in Arsenal than Chelsea at the moment. Those four have great fixtures this weekend. And by the way, Chelsea have Leicester at home as well anyway. So there's great fixtures for all five, and even United at Southampton. So the big six all got great fixtures this weekend. The problem is, you're absolutely right. You look at Liverpool at the moment, you go, I can't go this double defensive anymore. Their next four games, Bournemouth at home, Newcastle at home, who very good at the moment, strong, be a difficult game. I note that Callum Wilson's going for a scan on his hamstring this morning. Surprise, surprise. They could be Chris Wood up front. Okay. Following that, they go to Everton, then they've got Wolves at home. I think in three of the next four, Liverpool play three of the weakest attacks in this league in the next four games in Bournemouth, Everton and Wolves. Wolves, tough game. You can see it now, can't you? 1-0, 2-0, Liverpool. Everton could be anything at Goodison. Bournemouth at the weekend could be anything. Newcastle will obviously be a tough game, but it is at Anfield as well. Do I really want to come off? Am I better off holding my nerve? Or do they have fundamental problems, Liverpool, that can't be fixed to the extent that their top four places at risk all of a sudden? We've just gone through a weekend in FPL where... Cancelo's got a zero point. A Trent zero point. what Robertson one point. A Reese James one point. Are shit, right? It's only the, the Tottenham and the Arsenal players have delivered defensively. But when you look again, what's to come this weekend? Could all go back the other way, couldn't it? Yep. And I think he's, he's quite good for the game that this has happened, despite the fact I own a number of these players. I think it's good. I think a lot of people are, are coming off, and that makes me want to stay on because I'm. I look at those next four fixtures for Liverpool and I think there's three clean sheets there. So maybe the best thing to do is sit tight and do nothing. I could take that minus four, couldn't I? Jesus could outscore Salah. It's not impossible this weekend. Perisic might not even start at Forest. I think he does at the moment, but he might not. It could be a complete waste of a minus four. It could be. But then the way I look at it is uh, this is all about managing your team at the end of the day. You get your transfers every well, week for a reason. Other- I, I'm looking at it, and if I make these moves, because um, otherwise I could sit tight and do nothing. I need to make two moves this week. I can't make one because any single I don't have any money in the bank, so any single move is sideways, and there's no sideways moves I want to make. So I could just downgrade Alisson to Sanchez, but then why wouldn't I not go and get a Salah and captain him and, and look for a very, very big upside so I have to make two moves, which means that um, that, that I think that's the one I'm going to do. I'm going to keep my own uh, value if anyone's about to fall and rise this week um, with a view to go back to KDB. Yeah. Well, this is why I'd, I'd part considered the idea of wildcard, not because I massively want to change the team. Yes, I want to change a couple of bits. Like I would go with Mo Salah now. Hands up, mistake. I mean, even last night, little involvement. He's still got a goal, hasn't he? Mm. To be fair, again, on timeline last night, it was like, he's done nothing again. It was exactly the same when it was at Fulham. He's done nothing. He's been shit. Bang, goal. That's why he's, he's the king of FPL, isn't he? Let's yep. be honest, he's the king. Um, so, yes, I would get him in and catch him. It was more a case of looking at the value perspective. I know this week I'm going to lose value in Sun, who I'm not desperate in holding. I'm probably going to lose more in Robertson. Probably going to lose on Trent. And there were players like Perisic... KDB slash Salah, I think the investment will come for now where I could just shove those problems and asking myself, because we keep asking it. A, a lot of us who haven't wildcarded are asking the same question. Well, when am I going to wildcard? Is it that pretenders period I keep talking about, sort of seven, eight, nine? Is anyone going to be brave enough to actually come off? 
the big boys. There's a lot of people, I think, of doing it now and going, ah, right, sod it, fuck this big at the back. I, I can't be dealing with that. The problem is, when you have weeks like this, the floor is so low. You have strikers blank. And actually, it's the Jesus and Holland are kind of holding up a lot of teams' attacks at the moment. Martinelli, Salah. It's the defensive guys that are letting kind of the template down. The problem is, when you have a bad week like this, the floor is so low. So what? Cancelo, zero. Trent, zero. Yeah. Would it have reached James? One or zero? One. One. Robertson, one. So those four are the most popular floor four, arguably, if... Because I think if you could have four Liverpool players, Robertson's ownership would have been a lot higher as well. They've got, what, two points between the four of them from Madness. the top three teams this weekend. Even if you went Ruben Diaz, for example, it's the same shit, right? You've got nothing this week. The only ones who've got anything from the, the bigger clubs this week is the Perisic. Or obviously people have got like Saliba and, and Arsenal defensive and stuff. That will flip. It will indeed. Uh, listeners, hope you enjoyed a little rundown on Manchester United Liverpool from yesterday. Uh, we have Sky Fantasy Football coming at you tomorrow. Uh, did you I already know. Salah and Sky. I did, and oh, at least did that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and also, uh, you still don't own Marcus Rashford, do you? That one's going to kick got, in the I, balls a little bit. Well, you know, I captain Zaha last week. Yeah. In the second team. Yeah. I only brought Rashford back into the second team last night. Oh, lovely. For Zaha, captain. No, I oh, didn't. Salah, no. stick on Salah. But his no. points is better than nothing. So Sky Fantasy Football t- for tomorrow, uh, and we'll be back at you. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you are listening to the podcast. Other than that, though, stay safe. Ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Well done, United. We battered you. You well deserved it. Cue music, please, man, child. <laughs>